So one of the things that I find really exciting about mixing and mastering today in 2016 and beyond is that software and the new technology has allowed us to go into new areas that were just not possible before. So we've got new tools now, which from my point of view, whether it's my own music or somebody else's music that I'm mixing and mastering, I can just get it much closer to the ultimate sound I want to hear a lot easier um, than was ever possible before. And so this is this is really exciting and, and, and great uh, in many ways for for me from the point of view of, of crafting the sound of the music and also for, for the listener. And a lot of times I find myself mixing jazz and world music and classical music. Um, and with this kind of music, I, I want a really organic sound. So I want to really hear the, the wood of, of an acoustic bass or the, um, um, the unique tone of a particular drum or you know, the, uh, the detailed timbre of, of a singer uh, or a sax player. Because with this kind of music, you've got great musicians, I mean, world-class musicians, and when you've got musicians of their caliber, um, every little thing they do is important. It's part of the expression, it's part of the music. And the way they use and manipulate tone is all part of the music and the expression of the music, which is very important uh, musical information there. So you want that to be easy to hear. And if anything, you know, for the listener and an enhanced listening experience of that. And that's what's so fantastic about the new uh, digital tools is that you can get that organic richness much better than you ever could before. And I'll talk a little bit about how and why that has happened. And just really in the past few years, it, it's happened. A lot of people know, even if they don't know much about um, mixing and mastering, they know that analog equipment um, has this can have a great piece of analog equipment anyway, um, can impart a, a beautiful aspect to the sound of, of audio or music passing through it. Software developers found ways of recreating this analog hardware, exact pieces of analog hardware in software, so that it sounded, in many cases, virtually indistinguishable. And more recently, in the past few years, it's got so close now that it really sounds indistinguishable. And if there is a slight difference, it, it, it's less of a difference between the software and the particular piece of hardware that they've, they've um, recreated than another example of that same piece of hardware in another studio. Because of course, no two pieces of hardware, even by the same manufacturer, even manufactured in the same year, sound the same. It means there's a lot less compromises. It means if you want um, the things that, that analog can bring to the sound like, um, you know, s sweetness and richness. This can all be done so much better now and with a lot less compromise because it used to be that you only had a few pieces of really high-end audio gear. And even in a very good studio, you might have two, three of a particular compressor or two or three of a particular EQ. It was full of compromises. And now what's fantastic is that you can have as many of the best sounding particular piece of hardware as you want. You can have one on every channel in the software world and you can change your mind at any time. You can be right near the end of a, of a mix or a mastering session and think, well, actually, you know what? That decision I made an hour ago about the sound of the kick drum or whatever it was, you know, I think I might want to change that. And you can just, you can go and change it. Whereas in the analog world, yeah, that was often just not possible. And in many other ways, there's lots of compromises too, because the other problem with hardware was, you know, however good it sounded, a particular piece of hardware would have something great that it did, say to the top end or the bottom end of a sound. But with that came other changes you didn't necessarily want for that particular piece of music or that particular instrument. But if you wanted that extra sweet top end, you had to take with that what it might do to the overall energy feel of the of the instrument or the bottom end of the instrument or the fact that it might cloud it a little bit you just have to live with that for 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 what you got from it there was always a trade-off and what's fantastic about the software is you no longer need to do that you can choose just that particular aspect you want you just want to sweeten a certain area of the mid-range on a particular instrument but you don't affect anything else about it that's 
That's what software is, is so amazing at. And that's why it, in many ways it's taken us beyond what hardware could ever do. And of course, there are many new tools just in the past couple of years that have come out, which have gone even further and allowed uh, me as a mixing and mastering engineer and, and, and other mixing master engineers, of course, who have taken advantage of the new tools to just get you closer to what it really sounds like sitting in front of the instruments. And that to me is with the kind of music that I, I tend to mix and master, that's what it's all about. What I'm looking for in sound is I want to hear a rich, big, but tight and controlled bottom end. In the mid range, it's a very important area. I don't want any muddiness, but what I really do want is a, a very detailed, velvety, rich middle frequency area where you can really hear um, important um, uniqueness in instruments. For example, the uh, the rich timbre of a voice or a, or a, or a trumpet, or the woodiness in a in a bass. Um, or the particular ring of a unique sounding drum, all these kinds of things and many others are all the kinds of um, sounds which I want to uh, enhance and, and bring out in a, in a recording. And then for the, and the mid range can, can go a long way to, a beautiful sounding mid range can go a long way to um, bringing that detail out. And then the top end, I want an airy, sweet, beautiful top end. And these are all things that um, are so much easier to get now with the new tools. That is a very exciting time. Um, I think both for people who are doing the, the sound crafting and um, for musicians and listeners. And the other things I look for in sound is I like um, a lot of depth in the sound. Now, depth is one of these words which is bandied about a lot and most of the time people don't define what they mean by depth and that means for me it doesn't mean anything it could mean many things and what, what I found out when I actually asked people what, what do you mean by depth or warmth or any of the other descriptive words which are often bandied about with regards to music is that everybody has a different idea when asked to actually describe what it means and I think there can be a little bit um, misleading some of these terms when they're not defined because you just don't really know what somebody's actually saying you just assume your own idea about what what you think it means which may be very different from what they actually mean so when i say depth i'm talking about the distance from the front to the back of the music so you can have things that are further back into the speakers behind the speakers even and things which are right up front and that distance sometimes of instruments and sometimes just of the room or the space the instruments are in and the way that frequencies of the instruments might resonate within a 3d space that's what i mean by depth and i like to hear a lot of depth in music because it gives the instruments a place to be in the music a place to be in and that also means i like a lot of uh, width stereo width so you get a place a beautiful place for the music to be in and um, for me, that's, that's important. And it particularly suits things like jazz and world music and classical music. And again, the new tools just make that, that so much easier to do.